everybody. Welcome to Bug Fest. Um, while we are waiting to go live with our program, why don't you go ahead and type into the chat and let us know if you have a favorite bug movie, because today we're talking about bugs on film. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, I think my favorite, one of my favorites is probably A Bug's Life, which is probably a very popular answer. But um, And Adrian, you were saying earlier, what was your favorite movie? Oh, definitely. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It's the best bug movie there is. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so go ahead and let us know in the chat. And um, before we really dive into our topic, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick Zoom tutorial just for those of you joining us on Zoom who might be um, new to the platform. All right, so your screen might look something like this. Um, we do ask that you stay muted and keep your video off just for your privacy throughout the program. If you would like to turn on the captions, you can do so by clicking that button that says CC. And you'll see this menu that says show subtitle and that will bring up the live captions. You can always go into the subtitle settings to you know, change the way they look if you need to. And you might be seeing something like this where um, our videos are kind of over the shared screen that we do. And so you'll want to turn it on to make sure it's on speaker view, right? So that you're looking at the, the main speaker. And then you'll want to go down to side by side mode right here. And that will make it look like this. And then there's this really nifty little line here that you can drag from left to right if you want to make the speaker view bigger or if you want to make the shared screen bigger. Lots of options there. And whether you're joining us on YouTube or on Zoom, we would love to hear your questions and your comments. So, um, you know, type into the chat box and just remember to be a good digital citizen. So um, be nice to everybody, respectful, and um, try to stay on topic with your questions and comments. Um, but we would love to hear from you. All right. So I... I'm so happy to introduce our guest speaker today. We have Dr. Adrian Smith, the head of the Evolutionary Biology Research Lab here at the museum. And you may have also seen some of his incredible videos on the Ant Lab YouTube channel. And if you haven't, then you will see some of them today in this program. So, hey, Adrian. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, Bugfest folks. Um, let me share my screen here and we will start. Oh, and we had some other good movies. The Fly. That's a creepy movie, but good. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? The whole slide? We're good. All right. Awesome. Okay. So I only have 24 slides, so that's not very much. So, uh, light up that chat with uh, comments and questions and stop me in the middle of anything I'm saying and we can talk about it. Um, Cause what this is gonna do is I just wanna show you some of the coolest things I think I filmed over the past year. I spent a lot of my time as a scientist filming bugs and putting bugs on the internet. And so this is more bugs on the internet. And these are sort of the greatest hits of the last year. Things that I think are uh, the most interesting things. And then I'll give you some sort of how it's done kind of behind the scenes and show you some unpublished stuff and even some upcoming stuff that hasn't uh, hit the mean streets of the internet yet. All right. So if you're unfamiliar with, with my stuff, you can check it out on YouTube over at the Ant Lab YouTube channel, which I think is linked uh, if you're watching this on YouTube in the description. Uh, you might have also seen it if you live in North Carolina on public television, a bunch of uh, my stuff has been, I made it into segments for the TV show Sci and C, which uh, airs on PBS North Carolina. There'll be more of that um, upcoming soon too. And so this shows you kind of the range of topics that I've, I've um, made media about over the last year. All the stuff uh, with the background in, in yellow is all the stuff that's published on Ant Lab. And then I did a couple of collaborations um, with some other channels on YouTube that if you if you watch YouTube, you might be familiar with like, um, okay, it's okay to be smart, which is another PBS thing. And then Zay Frank, who does the true facts videos, the kind of uh, comedic uh, takes on natural history. We did a whole one on trap giants, uh, which was super fun. 
So I want to show you some of what I think are the coolest things I was able to capture with insects. There's not a lot. There's actually no bees in this presentation, but there is one bee related thing at the end that I'll close with um, that you can actually hear more about later on in bug fest. So it's a slight break from bees, but plenty of other stuff to look at. Okay. So this is my favorite thing that I took a video of between last September and right now. Um, does anybody know what it is? Can anybody identify it just from this? Anybody in the chat? A moth. Yes, it is a huge moth. Correct. It is a polyphemus moth. So I'm going to show you what it looks like in flight. This is captured at 6,000 frames per second. Uh, and this thing is just spectacular. Um, you can see how, how, how furry the scales are. Um, as it shows you the undersides of its wings, you can see the two windows in its wings that are clear spots. You can look at the bottom wing. You can see some damage from maybe when a bird tried to get it. Its bottom wing is ripped. And this is a jump starting its flight. Just an amazing creature. This thing uh, is, it belongs to a whole group of moths called Saturnid moths, which are the giant moths like Cecropia moths or Luna moths or Atlas moths, some of the biggest moths in North America. Someone's asking what are the clear spots for? I have no idea. I, I, don't, I don't study moths. I just think they're cool um, and, and try to put them on video in ways no one has yet. But this thing, this um, moth is, is basically the size of my hand. Like if you spread out its wings, it'd be, it'd be that big. Um, some cool research just came out about moths, uh, which it came out this week, which I just saw, which is amazing. I wanted to share it with you. It's kind of related to what I just showed you. Um, with other Saturnid moths, uh, or moths uh, in that same group, like things like Luna moths or Cecropia moths, if, you, if you've ever seen a Luna moth, there's a picture of one in, in the upper right that has a little kind of scraggly tail on its rear wing. And so what this paper shows is that function that features in, in moths wings and these huge moths uh, that are like kind of crinkly and all, all sort of um, uh, uh, wrinkly and kind of bunched together and rippled and folded. Those things are actually acoustic lures to lure bats that are hunting these moths away from striking the body. So they're actually acoustic reflectors. They reflect like the, the ultrasonic signals that the moth that the baths are, are sending out. And that's what sort of lights up in the in the acoustic space for the bat. And that's what the bat is, is sort of decoyed to strike at. And they're the things that are the farthest away from the body. So like that, that that giant moth that I just showed you had a had a ripped uh, back wing. I don't know what that rip was from. It could have been a predator. Um, but that's kind of the idea is that things like Atlas moths in this picture here or the Luna moths are kind of having these acoustic decoys way far away from their body. And it's far enough because they're so huge that it might be actually decoying uh, bats to strike at that. Some really cool science about that. And you can see uh, this picture in the middle is like the acoustic properties of this, of this Atlas moth and the red spots are the spots that light up and reflect back the ultrasonic stuff. Um, and you see how the rest of it is kind of black, doesn't really reflect at all. It's probably another function of these hairy scales. They actually absorb um, these frequencies uh, where the moth doesn't want to be um, sort of uh, obvious to a bat, to an acoustic hunter like that. So some cool stuff that just came out uh, about this, not my research at all, but I saw it and I had to share it. So that moth that I showed you was part of a moth video. I put out a compilation video of a whole bunch of moths flying like that in slow motion, just to sort of share the glory of moths with everybody. Um, and this is how it was all collected. So this I'm gonna show you is uh, where that moth came from. This is actually, we are in a family vacation at my in-law's house in, in New Hampshire. And at night I would go out uh, in the woods and set up uh, what's, a, what's known as a black light or light trap. Um, so that's basically taking an old bed sheet, hanging it up on a, on a, um, some apparatus and then, and then hanging a, uh, a black light there. And that attracts a whole bunch of insects um, that are active during night. Uh, and they come and they'll land and hang out there. And then you can sort of pick them off there. And in the case of the moths, pick them off, bring them in the basement, film them, then just let them go. And so that's where that, that moth came from. Um, but 
if you're in town, if you live in North Carolina or around the Mall Rally area, you have an opportunity to do this uh, with Bugfest. So this Saturday, September 18th, uh, there's a moth party out at the Prairie Ridge Eco Station. You can show up and you can do the same thing and attract attract a whole bunch of moths uh, that are flying here. We have really cool ones. We have we have what I just showed you, um, those moths uh, too. And we have, you know, Luna moths are done flying for the year, but there's other um, amazing moths that, that might show up along with other insects. So that's how that was collected. Um, here's how that was filmed. Uh, so here's the setup. It's really simple, um, uh, but except for the, the big chunky high-speed camera. So that's the camera that will film things in uh, super slow motion. So people always like gear, so I brought some gear to show. Uh, I think you can see me, right, in the presentation? Yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, Hulk can see you, and okay. if you want to make Adrian bigger, you can just slide it out to, over to the left. Slide that yeah, make me make me bigger for a second. <laughs> so you can see in that in that picture, that's that's the setup that was used for the for the moth. And so this is the platform that you just saw that giant moth uh, jump off of. So there's other videos in this presentation you'll see, and this is about um, about I think uh, let's see how big is this? It's about um, six centimeters or so uh, wide. So most of the insects I do jump off of this. Uh, it's just a piece of plexiglass with a piece of um, tape over it. So it gets kind of a textured uh, top to it. Um, the whole thing is filmed with one of these. This is a high-speed camera. This thing can capture insects at up to a couple hundred thousand frames per second. Um, I usually film somewhere between six and 10,000 frames per second. Uh, most of the stuff I'll show you today is probably in the three to 6,000 range. Uh, it's all filmed through a macro lens. So this is a, a lens that can capture sort of normal scale pictures, but also magnified pictures. Um, so a lot of the small stuff you have to really zoom in on. Hey, Adrian, I don't yeah. know if I missed you um, explaining this, but when you put the tape over that, um, the like the stand that they jump off mm -hmm. of, is that just so they can hold on to it better or, or why is that? Yeah, so it's the sticky side is down on this. And so this acrylic is smooth. It's like kind of, you know, like glass and a lot of insects would slip. Their legs would just slip. They wouldn't be able to grip it. So this is just a piece of um, tape that has kind of a texture to it so that the ins it's still flat. So I can get a nice, you know, not, not curvy surface for them to even for them to walk on and then they can grip it with their little tarsal claws. They won't slip out of it. Very cool. And this might be a really silly question, but did you figure that out the hard way, like by trying to film insects that were falling off of it? Or did you, did you know that because of your... Yes. Yeah. yeah. I have a video I published um, maybe a year and a half or two years ago uh, that has a more slippery surface. It's one that I did with um, hoppers, leaf hoppers, frog hoppers. And a bunch of them, when they jump off the platform, you can see their their hind legs kind of slip. They kind of like, you know, if you're trying to run really fast on like tile or linoleum with socks and you're, yeah. you're just going like that, you Aww. can see a lot of insects doing that. Um, oh, but gosh. they can still jump, uh, but they're just, you know, don't have the perfect grip there. So someone's asking, is this a phantom camera? Yes, this is a phantom camera. Um, so... Uh, the cameras, like if you if you watch uh, YouTube and see like the slow mo guys or something like that, it's um, similar cameras to this. Even some like Hollywood movies uh, use that. Um, this is kind of a mid mid tier uh, phantom camera. It's not the best. It's not the worst. It's you know it's good enough. Um, other things that I use to film this. So this is a giant LED array. So when you film small stuff and it's going really fast and really high frame rates, you need a lot of light. So uh, this is the main light I use. And then the other stuff is really, really simple stuff. So this is a really cheap background LED, sort of a small thing. And I put this on full blast behind the subject, um, shoot it through a piece of diffusion paper like this. This is transparent sort of photo diffusion paper. And then you get a nice background and you can even add, you know, like in the moth thing, like little colored gels on top of it and make a nice, uh, colored gradient. Um, so that's kind of how how the, the filming works for a lot of this stuff. Um, here's an example of that exact setup. This is unpublished um, videos. These are scraps from that moth video. These are all moths that I couldn't get enough sequences of where I was happy enough to include them in the video. I'll show you a few of those. Um, this one has spectacular leg warmers. Um, it's 
the common name for this uh, moth is called the angel. It's kind of cool in this clip. You can see a bunch of the um, of the um, scales or hairs kind of fly off of it at the end. Yeah, someone's saying, look at the leg fluff. Yeah, great, great pants on this moth for sure. Um, here's another one that I couldn't quite get to jump in the way I wanted to or fly on frame the way I wanted to. Um, I got a couple of good sequences of it, um, but it was just kind of drab and kind of didn't cooperate too well in front of the camera, so it didn't didn't make it. And here's this little dude. Um, tiny moths, like things like plume moths, it, if you look at this one's hind uh, wings, they're not solid. They're more kind of like feather-like. Like you can see they're kind of frilled and feather feather feather-like. Uh, a bunch of small insects uh, have feathered wings instead of sort of um, full out cuticle on their wings, which is pretty interesting. Uh, someone's asking, how do I keep them in focus? Oh, it's Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. I know Caitlin. Um, I, so the trick with that is, uh, with keeping stuff in focus, small insect stuff, is to not move the camera. I don't ever touch the camera. Um, I move the subject. So I'll like this um, platform will be on like um, uh, on like a little uh, platform or something like that. And I'll have my hand underneath it and I'll move this um, and I'll be looking in a monitor in the camera and I'll move this in and out of focus. Um, so I don't use, I don't touch the lens. I don't touch the camera, but I just move the subject. So underneath all those shots, my hand is like moving the, the, the platform with the moth or with the insect around on it. Okay, let me show you some more clips. Uh, this one's all about juvenile insects. Um, so this is my uh, friend and colleague at NC State, Matt Bertone. I'll talk more about him later. Uh, and we are, he is on the campus of NC State. And that is a nice, beautifully newly dead oak tree. And it's infected with a fungus. And the fungus is underneath the bark. And when you look underneath the bark, there's a bunch of cool juvenile insects eating the fun fungus that's on the rotten bark. Kind of gross, but also spectacularly awesome. So we got a lot out of that dead tree, Matt and I. Uh, we actually made two videos and one science paper out of the things out of that tree, which is pretty cool. So those little things that uh, the arrow just pointed at are maggots. So these are juvenile flies um, that were fe feeding on that fungus in there. Um, and th they do a spectacular thing. So uh, in this image, let me move my cursor here. And this part is the tail of the fly maggot. And here's the head. It has two little spikes that come out that are called mouth hooks. And it's going to form a loop with its body and then do something incredible. If you've never seen a maggot jump, well, today's your lucky day. You just saw one. Now you're seeing another one, uh, which is great. That's a top-down view of a jumping maggot. Here's a side view. Uh, this is great. Did you know that fly maggots can jump? I mean, uh, you know, my life is way better after knowing that. And I think yours is going to be too. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? So this is filmed at like 3,000 frames per second. Um, it's very ballerina-like. Exactly. Definitely. Here's a nice top-down shot. You can see the mouth hooks. It forms a hook uh, and then it's kind of inflates its body by pumping a bunch of Insect blood, hemolymph, and then it all lets loose and it just flings itself into the air, kind of snaps itself free uh, from a coiled loop like that. And Adrian, this, did you see K uh, Caitlin's question in the chat? But why? Why do they do this? Caitlin, come on. We know that we don't, why questions are, are just so hard to answer. Uh, I, I very rarely answer why questions with my science. Uh, I try to focus on what questions and how questions, um, and I can speculate all day long about the whys. Yeah, escaping is probably one of them. Um, so these things live in kind of um, kind of temporary spots, like they're living in 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 between, uh, uh, you know, uh, the bark of a dead tree and and eating off the fungus that's under there and the bark's constantly falling off. So, you know, if a bird decides to go snack on some stuff um, and rips the bark off, uh, then you've, you've got to get out of there quick. Um, so it could be for dispersing, it could be for escape, it could be for predator avoidance, um, all those things. Um, and 
I often find those questions hard to answer scientifically with experiments. Um, and they're kind of secondary for me after answering the, the what questions or the how questions. Um, because as long as I see a behavior happen multiple times and an insect kind of doing the same thing, I know that it's not, you know, sort of a, a mistake. It's, it's a stereotypical behavior. Then, then what I like to do is try to focus on what is it doing? How is it doing? Well, how is this relevant to what other things like it do or don't do? And then kind of uh, at the end of, our, of most of these papers, that, that comes to speculation about why. But oftentimes we're just left to speculation. It's kind of disappointment and disappointed, but so, so much, yeah. Oh, sorry, Adrian. No, um, well, this is again about the why, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to know if you thought, Rexon suggested maybe it could be for them to jump from tree to tree um, or just to travel more quickly, at least between different trees. Do you think that could be a reason? Yeah, for sure. Some of these spring loaded things, um, the them doing jumps is way more efficient than them uh, getting around by other means. Um, so that's one thing that what we have and, and we do measure is like, what is the cost for them to um, walk or do some other mode? And in the case of maggots, like wiggle, basically squirm the same amount of distance. And oftentimes it's actually energetically more efficient to do these wild uh, freewheeling jumps. Um, so sometimes, yeah, it's a, it's an easier way to get around for them. For sure. Good question. This is what that maggot looks like as an adult. This is a lance fly. This is what they turn into. Um, and this, before this, uh, these, these flies were not known to be able to jump as maggots. Um, and we were able to do that uh, and document that uh, for the first time. Uh, the only other maggot that's been known to jump like that, um, or actually there's others that have been known, but this is the only one that's been filmed um, jumping in slow motion is actually done by a, by a research lab just down the road from us at Duke University, Sheila Paddock's lab. Um, they described a gall midge. Uh, you see the picture of the adult here and I just press play in the video. And this gall midge kind of jumps in a similar way, but where it curls its body up into a circle, but it's it kind of sits up when it does it. And it actually latches its body, not by using the mouth hooks. It actually has like Velcro pads on its body that actually, um, are on the, the micro and nano scale that, that have uh, sort of adhere to each other and form a latch. And then all of a sudden when that's slipped, then the whole maggot can jump and leap from that. So pretty cool stuff. Um, so a lot more jumping fly maggots than you'd suspect out there. Um, so for that one, we weren't able to get enough of maggots from the tree before the landscaping crew came and chopped it down and put it in the wood chipper which is a sad part of the story. But a uh, happy part of the story is that's not the only jumping larval thing we pulled out of that tree. This is another one. Um, this is a larval beetle. Um, and it is about the width of a pencil, about five and a half uh, millimeters long. And that's the adult on the tip of my finger. These are really small beetles and they do the same thing. They're living in underneath the the um, bark and they have the ability to jump. And that's what their jump looks like in real time. And here's it in slow motion at about 3000 frames per second. All these will jump in a second. They're pretty good at it. And when they jump, they also curl into a body and then they stay curled and kind of roll around or off the platform in this case to get around. Uh, they, they're able to jump about almost uh, about five body lengths and about in distance and about three body lengths in height. Um, and they do it in a, in a way that's very different from the, from the fly maggots. Um, uh, let me see if there's another video. Yeah. So here's one captured at 60,000 frames per second. This is super, super slow motion. Um, and this is what their body orientation looks like just before they take off. And you can see what they're doing is they're actually gripping the ground with their little tiny beetle claws. They're little microscopic claws. They're holding on as tight as they can. And that's actually an environmental latch. They can't jump off of smooth surfaces. They need something to grip onto. And so the thing that triggers their jump is they're kind of, they're kind of uh, building up some sort of internal spring that will sort of flex their head and thorax down underneath their body into a hoop. Uh, and this is all started when their little tiny beetle legs lose grip, which you'll be able to see here in a second. There it starts to lose grip. 
Now their head goes down and then they curl themselves. As they curl under, they, they're able to fling themselves up from that and then go into their um, sort of jumping body posture. So it's really cool that same environment, um, there are, uh, is that me or is that? Oh, there we go. In the same environment, uh, there are uh, two way vastly different insects, different insects in different orders um, that are able to, as larvae, uh, jump and do a spring-loaded jump. Uh, they're not dumping directly with muscles like we would. They're not using their leg muscles or, or their body muscles to push off the ground. They're actually building an internal spring and releasing that and jumping and exploding into the air, which is really cool. Hey, um, Adrian, we have yeah. a how question here in the chat from Bethany. Um, how do they survive the landing? Uh, which ones? Either one? Uh, well, so they, the mass of these things is really small. So there's not much force associated with um, things that are really, really tiny um, and jumping. So it, there's not much force is generated and there's not much sort of energy involved in in the on the scale that would affect their body, uh, that would affect them sort of uh, bouncing or, or being detrimentally affected from hitting the ground in any sort of way. So they're kind of too small to hurt themselves uh, in that sort of way. And Carrie wanted to know, how do you get them to jump? Oh, uh, they so the, a lot of these things jump as an escape mechanism. So if you put them in an unnatural environment, they will jump to sort of get themselves out of it. So that's uh, easy to induce in the lab when you take them out of their natural environment underneath that, that uh, uh, rotten tree bark and put them sort of in, a, in an arena on a platform like this uh, under a bright light. They're like, I got to get out of here. This is not definitely not in a dead tree. I, maybe I should jump and try to get somewhere. So it's pretty easy to induce for sure. Um, so what I just showed you actually is under review. So uh, we wrote this up as a paper, sent it off to peer scientists, and they're reviewing it for a publication right now. Um, and relative to other insects, what I just showed you, that beetle larvae is one of the um, least impressive uh, spring-loaded animals. Uh, a lot of things jump using a spring-loaded mechanism, a lot of insects, even other larval insects like I showed you, and almost all of them do it better than that beetle. A beetle's kind of the bottom of the barrel for uh, spring-loaded stuff, but I think that's what makes it cool. It doesn't have any specialized features that other spring-loaded animals do. I'll show you some of those later. Uh, it kind of does it with kind of a normal beetle body plan, but yet it's able to, to build an internal spring and use that to get around, which I think is, is pretty cool. Okay, uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, doing okay. Um, so this is uh, an insect called, a, or not an insect, an almost insect. It used to be an insect. Um, if you have an old insect identification guidebook, when I was in college, this used to be an insect. Now it's not. It's a hexapod. It's close to an insect, but not technically an insect. This is a springtail. This is it doing a jump off of water. Um, so this is the surface of a, of a cup, uh, kind of a little plastic cup, like a party cup. Um, and this is filled with water, and that's just how the springtail can actually jump off the surface of water and do tons of black, uh, back flips in the air uh, and jump uh, several body lengths away and then land on its head and float away in shame in this particular instance. Here's where these springtails live. This is a surface of a drainage ditch right on the side of 440, uh, right in my neighborhood. Um, it's a temporary pond. They showed up in mass. Um, and I collected a bunch and was able to film them and study them a little bit uh, before they disappeared. This is a uh, view of them through the surface of the water. And you can see how their leg or their tail, when they flip it down, it's just a spring-loaded appendage underneath their body, doesn't even pierce the surface of water. It actually physically sort of cavitates the water a little bit, and they're able to push off of the surface of the water by using their tail. Um, they're their spring-loaded appendage, which is pretty amazing. There are, that's an aquatic version of a springtail. Um, there are slightly more common uh, terrestrial versions. This is uh, ones that appear in my yard every winter in uh, January. This is uh, my deck. Uh, and these are ones that show up there. That's how fast they move relative to and how big they are. 
uh, relative to my finger. Uh, here's it captured in normal uh, view. This is 30 frames per second. Um, the only thing you can see when it jumps is there's one frame. If you zoom in, you can see that little tiny streak. That's how much they moved in one thirtieth of a second. They did about five backflips there, and it shows up as a streak in the video, and then sort of disappear. Here's what it looks like at 4,300 frames per second. Here's a bunch of them jumping. You can see how many hundreds of times their body height they're able to jump um, when they use a spring-loaded appendage, which is incredible. Um, not very many people have studied these. There's only uh, two published studies that have tried to describe uh, the kinematics or performance of springtail jumps. Uh, so some of this is brand new footage. This is what it looks like at 10,000 frames per second, still incredibly fast. And then here is the best footage you'll ever see of a springtail. Uh, this is 73,500 frames per second. This is microscopic and that's how it jumps. It's how it flicks its tail underneath its body. So right now we're working on this in the lab. Uh, we've been working on this for, for a while. Um, here, we're doing a descriptive study kind of describing how it gets off the ground, uh, how fast it's going, um, kind of describing its jump mechanisms. Um, we're looking at we're doing things like scanning electron microscope work to look at its anatomy, the, the bits of its body that it's using to get off the ground. This is that tail, that jumping appendage. This is the tip of the tail. Um, the scale on the right here is 50 micrometers, which is about the width of a hair on your head. Each one of those little serrated teeth is about three micrometers wide. So this is microscopic uh, stuff. And you can see how that would be super useful for getting a grip on the ground as it sort of flings that tail and kind of uses that tail to push itself against the ground into the air. So that's ongoing stuff. Hey, um, Ian, we had a yeah. question about um, the springtails. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the aquatic ones can jump on land? Maybe they, by can. they can. Yeah, I didn't show that video, but I, I do have video of them jumping off of land. They're uh, more coordinated when they jump off of, of water, actually. Off of water, they jump forward. Um, usually off of land, they can go sort of any way. They can, springtails can kind of direct their jumps by directing the orientation of their body and how they sort of position themselves before they fling the tail out from underneath their body. Um, but it seems like off the surface of water, when they jump, they're always going forward, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, I've never filmed anything, any springtail jumping off of water, jumping backwards. I, they only go forward and then slight sort of diagonals based off of that. But off of land, those aquatic ones just kind of go haywire. Uh, they can they can jump anyway. But yeah. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. I, I remember reading something about fleas being, you know, for any critter on earth, they could jump the farthest compared to their body size. Is that still true? Or, you know, do springtails take the, the record? Probably. Yeah. I think if I think fleas can jump farther relative to body size or body, yeah, body size than than springtails. Springtails spend a lot of energy um, spinning in the air. So fleas kind of kind of have a missile-like trajectory. Like they're jumping and they're pointing their heads and there they go and they're off. Springtails are bizarre uh, for jumping animals. Nothing else, as far as I know, um, spins as as fast as a, as a springtail. Nothing else does backflips like that when it jumps in the air. And there are a few other things that do flip, but nothing like is like doing the Sonic the Hedgehog like super flip, like when it jumps, except for springtails. And it's only the globular ones too. So there's long, there's kind of uh, elongated springtails, and those those kind of kind of are wild and loosey goosey in the air, but they're definitely not uh, doing the sort of special back flipping um, that the globular ones are. Oh, um, very cool. So yeah, yeah, yeah. cool stuff. Okay, click beetles. I, there's a click beetle fan in the chat. Let's go, click beetle fan. Here we go. This is the first uh, high-speed video of click beetles that I filmed, which inspired me to film a whole bunch of other ones and make a whole video about it. It's a click beetle you can find in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. This one just came from my yard, very common one. Click beetles are incredible. Um, they also don't jump with their legs. They do a, a sort of a, a body-powered thing, and they have a special bit of anatomy that they use for a latch to do it. Uh, again, that beetle was not hurt by... Uh, 
falling on the ground. Uh, here you can see a much better video after that one inspired me to take more of them. Another common click beetle um, captured in slightly better form here. Yeah, it kind of, it kind of, someone's admiring how it pulls its legs and yeah, kind of, kind of assumes like the missile shape and then kind of flings itself up in, into the air uh, with a jump. So the thing about beetles, click beetles that I was excited to film is that with a lot of these spring loaded things, you can't see the bits of anatomy that make them work because they're a lot of them are internal or they're really hard to, to visualize. But the click beetle, it's one of the, has one of the most obvious uh, components uh, uh, bits of anatomy that make it function that you can actually see, uh, which is cool. It, they, so with, with these, with spring loaded animals, there's a spring that holds the energy and then there's a latch that's there to hold the energy as it's being built up and then instantaneously release it. Um, you can think about a mouse trap. The latch of a mouse trap is what keeps all the energy sort of coiled up in that spring. And as soon as that latch slips, then it's instantaneously released. Like that's the latch of this mouse trap here. And as soon as that thing slips, the whole system is set in motion, and then you get this carnage on a pencil. Um, the same thing for click beetles. Their latch is right underneath their body. It's that little peg there that's uh, on their thorax. And there you can see it in action. It's, it's holding their spring in place here, and as soon as it slips, that's what triggers the entire jump. You can see their head rocking back and forth as it goes. Here's two close-up views. You can see the latch here, the latch here, and they're going to slip, and that triggers the entire jump, um, which is cool. You can actually see how it works. It's amazing, amazing bit of anatomy on these insects. And here's just another click beetle jump, because why not, right? Let's just watch some other. It just goes into space and never returns. Just uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. On that first video of the click beetle that you showed us, on its mm -hmm. way down, it was like rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling, like nonstop, it seemed. Yeah. Was it yeah. controlling those? Was it like tumbling on purpose or was that just? No. Okay. Uh, well, it's a hard question to answer. It's right. another one of those why questions. Uh, I can't really say scientifically if, and no one's shown if if the like, you know, the the wild spinning trajectory is is a selective thing. It's a if it's a product of selection. If there's a why to it, or if it's just an artifact of jumping that way. But yeah, they're they're not in control um, on the uh, especially on the descent of of how how they flip. So some of them on when they descend, they do like detach. They do employ their wings and kind of control their descent a little bit with their wings. But if they're staying in that sort of tucked position, they're just they're just along for the ride. They're just going for it. I bet that's fun. Looks like fun. Maybe. Who knows? Um, here's some really cool research that my uh, colleagues at University of Illinois uh, did. And I wanted to show you this because there are uh, more interesting ways to visualize insects than just a high-speed camera. Um, this is using a high-speed camera uh, that is shooting x-rays. So this is a live x-ray of a click beetle doing its clicking thing. And so to, to orient you, uh, we're looking at that bit of anatomy, that latch here. Um, and we're looking at, at the latch is going to slip, and then it's going to go into an internal cavity inside the beetle. So here's the latch is going to be right here, and it's going to swing here. Uh, and you're going to see this in live x-ray. And here we go. That's what it looks like on the inside for the beetle, which is just amazing that you can uh, image uh, live insects doing incredible things like this. So they did this to, to sort of document the loading and the release mechanisms uh, of this jump, did a really cool study uh, describing that. Hugo's asking, do they control the direction they are jumping? I don't think so, but I wouldn't be surprised if they could. All right. Um, Let's see, what else we got? Oh, okay. Uh, these are the last couple. Um, and I found it a new hobby that, you know, when my kids go to bed, I'm putting out the black light out in the back, my back porch and I'm collecting uh, cool insects that fly at night to my house and then uh, filming them when I get a chance in flight. 
because uh, I think science is about doing experiments, it's about discovery, it's, it's about describing the world in a new way. But I think it's also about that's just one way of seeing and appreciating the world and life in a new way. And science is all about that. So for me, I, it's important for me to do, to do the research studies, to do the experiments, to publish the peer reviewed papers, but it's also important to me to use my position as a scientist to help other people see the world and appreciate the world in a new way. Um, and I really get a kick out of it myself too, because I want to see the world in a new way too. Um, and for me, a lot of that has, uh, in the last year, been filming insects in flight in super slow motion in the nicest way I possibly can. And out of that, one of my most important discoveries is that beetles are one of the goofiest and most charismatic flying contraptions ever uh, on Earth, uh, especially weevils. So this little guy uh, is one of my favorite weevils that uh, it's a... It's a um, uh, a nut or an acorn weevil with a huge long snout and it is going to eventually think about getting into the air and when it does that it's going to unfold its wings going to hold up its middle legs like that that's a great position good job beetle here come its wings and they're going to start the flapping and then there we go off on your little gonzo flight just great right i mean what else is better than that nothing there's nothing better than that um, so that's from an insect video, an insect flight video that I published earlier this year, and I can't get enough of filming insects in flight. So I'm going to show you some um, uh, recent stuff from unpublished stuff that hasn't uh, debuted yet. Um, right now it's mantis season, so a lot of, there's a lot of adult mantises out and about uh, hanging out. This is a Carolina mantis uh, that uh, at one point lived in my yard. Maybe it still does. I don't know. This is a male. Uh, and this is what a uh, praying mantis looks getting into the air. Just a fantastic insect. It's nothing like a mantis. I like the little flip of its tarsi as it gets into the air. Why not? A little extra flip for style. Uh, here's a frontal view of it. Uh, watch how it, it raises its, it goes claws first into the air. So it's got its raptorial claws and it throws them up into the air and sort of Leads claw first. I mean, if you're a mantis, why not? You gotta, you gotta fly that way. Um, what's next? Oh, these are a much less intimidating, uh, not mantis. These are mantis flies in a totally different order of insects. These are more related to lace wings, but they have the same raptorial front appendages uh, that praying mantises do. These are. Uh, much less intimidating, they kind of flutter. They keep their, keep their nice predator arms all folded. They're not going claws first into the air. They're just, you know, daintily fluttering into the air. Really great stuff there. Yep, keeping their arms tucked for sure. So that's some cool footage. Um, and then I will leave you with this clip. So if you register for Dr. Matt Bertone's talk, on BugFest this Wednesday from 10 to 11, just go to bugfest.org and, and register for it. You're gonna wanna see it. You will see more about this individual thing, this exact insect. This is a bee fly, which is a parasitoid uh, fly that lays, that throws its egg into the nest of a carpenter bee. The egg hatches into a larvae. The larvae attaches to the developing carpenter bee, eats it alive develops as an adult into an adult bee and then emerges out of that um, carpenter bee nest as one of these things to go repeat the cycle. And so this uh, this one, uh, Matt and I, Matt reared it until it's a uh, pupil stage then gave it to me. Uh, I saw it through as an adult and then was able to film it and then give it back and now it lives in the insect collection at NC State. And I'm sure Matt will show you the developmental stages of this individual um, in his talk. But these are really uh, nice looking flies. You can see uh, the sort of marbled patterning of its wings. If you get a close look, you can see the little gyroscopes, the hull tears flapping underneath the giant front wings. Um, really cool fly, giant fly. Um, flies, flies look, flies definitely don't have the style points of a weevil uh, going into the air, but it's still kind of cool nonetheless. Okay. Well, thanks, son. Thanks for joining me on this journey uh, through some cool insect clips. Uh, there's more soon coming out on Ant Lab on YouTube, or you can see some of these uh, things 
on Sci and C. The next season will start October 7th, Thursday. So just get your rabbit ears up and uh, you can watch that on PBS and you'll see things like the moths and some of the jumping maggots and some other segments uh, from me uh, this season over on PBS. So thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. Um, I agree with Carrie. I could watch these videos all day. And I think my favorite video of yours is actually the one featuring your, your mom. Your, oh, yeah. It's you know, a classic. It's an old yeah, one. Yeah, it's very classic. Um, all right, everyone. Well, thank you again so much for joining. Um, before you go, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to our Bugfest sponsor, BASF. And of course, thank you to the Friends of the Museum members who support our research and programs and everything we do at the museum every day. Um, you can get a Bugfest t-shirt on our website. And if you would like to join or renew your museum membership, you can get one for free. Um, so yeah, thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Check out all of our other Bugfest programs and have fun. <laughs>